Luke chapter 17 and uh, verse 12 is a story that I think fits here right now. Very, very appropriate. And, he, and as he was going into the village, he was met by 10 lepers. He was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance, okay? And they raised up their voices and called, Jesus, Master, take pity and have mercy on us. And when he saw them, uh, he said to them, go at once and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cured and made clean. Awesome. And then one of them, uh, upon seeing uh, that he was cured, uh, this is the key component, these two verses coming up. Uh, <clears throat> upon seeing that he was cured, turned back, recognizing and thanking uh, and praising God uh, with a loud voice. Isn't that awesome? All, almost like what you saw here today uh, is that these uh, 10 lepers come uh, and they stood back. They didn't approach Jesus. And then because it was a thing that you didn't do, it was an unclean spirit. And, uh, and, and yet Jesus, uh, he just spoke and those men uh, walked away and God had done a miracle for them. And, and it says, and he fell, the same man that came back. The key is he turned back. And he fell prostrate at Jesus' feet, thanking him over and over, and he was a Samaritan. Can you hear that? And then Jesus asked, uh, were not all ten cleaned, cleansed? Uh, and uh, where, are they, where are the nine, he says. And was there no one found to return and to recognize and give thanks and praise to God except this alien? And verse 19, and he said to him, get up. And go your way. Your faith, your trust, and confidence that spring uh, from your belief in God has restored you to health. What a powerful story. And, and here it is now. I'm going to try to break this down, and I'm going to stay in this portion. I'm not going to be off somewhere else. I'm going to be right here. This is where you need to be today. And, and <clears throat> is this not uh, the message uh, today uh, that we're living in, this message of the hour? When on a hill framed by uh, three crosses, mankind concluded uh, that it was done. Now listen good. Mankind concluded that it was done. When a body was taken down from a cross and wrapped and placed in the finality of a tomb. And when the grand spectacle was over and everybody went home to the regularity and routine of their sluggish lives. When everyone thought nothing to be different they, and that hoped uh, was now sealed in history. And everyone determined uh, a beginning uh, as a conclusion. And with the lesson of Easter, Resurrection Sunday, apparently yet unlearned mankind has far too often carried that suffocating pattern of behavior right into the present, leaning, uh, uh, leaving our lives uh, and our culture littered with graves filled with things yet much alive. Resurrection declares that our motion and our notion of conclusions are nothing more than indicators of a beginning. How many of you know you can go through an experience in life and you can come uh, even see it uh, changed uh, and, and, and you walk away and you see that the change took place uh, but something didn't happen uh, to get you in the right place. Uh, you were only thrilled to get out of the old place. How many of you know when you, I got out of jail or I got out of drugs or I got out of all that, I was thankful to be out but that's all I was was out. I was out of jail, just waiting for the next opportunity to go back to jail. Come on. But what happened was, when I got saved, uh, I came out of uh, the sin life, uh, and I didn't just come out. Uh, now I came out and went somewhere. Now I came out and came alive, and what was in front of me became greater than what was behind me. And like the one man uh, who was a, a leper, what did he do? Uh, what the other nine saw was an end, a conclusion to a decaying husk uh, of something old. Those men, the nine, walked away. They were glad they weren't lepers. But they thought that was the end of it. 
How many of you know if Jesus raises you from the dead, that's not the end, that's the beginning. If Jesus heals your blind eyes, uh, that's not the end. You got your miracle. Now you have something to do with your new eyes. I laid in a bed from an accident in 1974 in a hospital, and they told me I would never see out of my left eye. And my retina was knocked off, and my color of my eye leaked down my cheek. And they told me I'd be blind for life. And they told me that there was only a 50% chance I'd keep the sight in the other eye. Make this a little thinner. And it would be just that I would probably have difficulty even with the good eye. And there I laid in the bed of a hospital for 12 days and I hemorrhaged. And, and I knew the Lord. I had just gotten saved not long before that. And what was so wonderful was I was laying there one night and Jesus came in my room uh, by the Spirit and, he, and, and the room lit up like, a, like daytime and, and the warmth of God's love covered me and I knew right then that God had healed me. I pulled the patch off and I could see the fluorescent light over top of my bed. Uh, and I began to yell for the nurses uh, and they came and they humored me and said, Sir, it's okay, we understand. You really can't see. It's just the light from the other eye and they put the patch back on. Well, they said, your doctor's coming in in the morning. And how many of you know, morning meant noon. And so I waited and waited. And finally, he came in. And I was about ready to bust. And he came in and he said, let me look at you. And he pulled the patch off. And he said, how many fingers? And he did all that. And I said, one, three, two, one, thumb. He went, my God, you can see. I said, I've been telling you that. And from that day on, my vision became 2010. And God did a miracle. Yet inside my eyes, tore all to pieces. Why? Because God wanted me to be reminded that it was him that touched me. But I told God this. Uh, as I laid there that day, I said, God, uh, I said, I had eyes, and I really didn't serve you. But now, Lord, if you choose to let me be blind, then, God, I can tell you this. I'm going to still serve you no matter if I got eyes or don't have eyes because when I had eyes, I didn't serve you. But now, God, if I'm supposed to be blind, I'm going to still serve you. Then when he healed me, I said, how could I not realize uh, that my healing wasn't the conclusion? Uh, it was only the beginning of something. Do you know if God touches you in this room here today? It's not to get your miracle. It's to get you to do something great for him. You see, we've made the miracle the end. We've run to God and said, God, heal me. We get healed and we're like the leper. Nine of us run away. One, though, said he turned back. There's something about a person who turns back and revisits uh, the goodness of God uh, and revisits the, the well of God and, and goes back there and says, I, I can't leave this thing undone. Uh, I got to go back. I got to find out who it was that touched me. I got to go back and declare that it was his goodness who touched me. How many say, Lord, thank you today. Help me to see past the miracle for my day. Let me go a little further. What this one unnamed soul, you could put your name uh, in that blank there, what this one uh, unnamed soul saw was not the end of something or a conclusion uh, to a horrible life, but he saw the new beginning. He saw his new life. He saw new opportunities. Uh, like the man said, I was blind, but now I see. Like the man in the story, he said, I can take my kids fishing. I can dance with my wife. Uh, I can run and leap. Uh, he said, I have something to do now that I hadn't been able to do before. Yeah. Have you hear me? Let me tell you something today. Healing lines are full of people that are just like the nine. You come to church and you come to church to get. You come to church to get God to do something to bless you. When you get the blessing, you go away and you forget to come back and give him the glory. And because of it, you only have that moment with him. Uh, but if you'll turn and go back, uh, you'll never forget his face. You'll never forget who it was that touched you. You'll never forget that he's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, he's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is Jehovah Shalom. Uh, he is Jehovah your healer. He is God. Uh, Jehovah he is God. I'm here to raise, raise you up today. I'm here to raise you up today. 
but I don't want to raise you up so you get goosebumps on your goosebumps. Uh, I want you to get a hold of the reality that if God touched you, there's something now that you owe to him. Look at this, look at this. A sunset is nothing more and nothing less than the backside of a sunrise. The leper's response is our message uh, of this great resurrection Sunday today. Verse 15 and 16 of Luke uh, uh, 17, our story begins uh, when we walk out of here today. For some of you and for others, it began uh, at another moment when the end became the beginning. How many of you hear me today? The end must become the beginning. If the end becomes the end, then you have no new life. Can you hear that today? If all you came to do was to get Jesus to touch you, then you have no new life. But the Bible says he came to make us a new man. He came to give us a, a new heart and a new spirit and to make us new creatures in Christ Jesus and old things pass away. And behold, all things become new. I love this. Look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. You can put it on the screen. And they have overcome. I don't miss this because I'm ready to land. And they have overcome, conquered uh, him by means of the blood of the lamb and by the utterance of their testimony. And they did not love and cling to life even when faced with death, holding their lives cheap till they had to die for their witnessing. How have you hear that? How have you know they, they, they overcame by the utterance of their testimony? You see, that man, each one of them, the girl that was healed of the issue of blood, she testified to the girl's, uh, da the man's daughter who needed her dad to be healed. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a testimony. Everybody has a story when you meet Jesus. Can you hear that? Everybody in this room today has a story when you meet Jesus and when you leave. Listen, when I got saved, uh, I went out into the street and I was an ex-surfer. So I went in the streets and I went to the surf shops and I went to all the places where my old buds were and I found guys. And one after another, I led them to Jesus because I told them, I don't know what happened. I don't want to get stoned anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I want Jesus. And they went, man, something's changed. Uh, two police officers came to my church to see if it was true when I got saved uh, they sat there with their police gear on their badges their guns and I looked out there from the platform that morning and said oh my god because I thought they were there to arrest me <laughs> they had arrested me so many times I just knew it was another one of those days and do you know I had the cruelest pastor in the world I didn't say cool I said cruel <laughs> he turned that Sunday morning and he said uh, you know I feel Bart needs to get up and give his testimony I'm going, no, not today. These two cops are there. Well, he don't know that. Hey, I get up and I go, um, I'm, I don't even look at him. You know, I go up and I said, Jesus is good and he saved me and I thank you. And I sat down and he, my pastor said, what was that? That was lousy. He said, let me tell you his story. And I'm going, oh. Both those cops came to the altar and got saved. About six months later, one of them got shot and got killed. Thank God he went to be with the Lord. Could your story cause a revolution to break out in your school? How many of you are here in college? Put your hands up. I want to see the college kids. Look at that. There's a lot of college kids in here. How many of you know that your testimony, your voice uh, could be exactly what happened where they say of you, here comes those students that have turned other schools upside down, have now come into Towson, Coppin, Morgan, uh, and the rest, uh, and they've come into our city. How many of you know our story is that powerful? And he welcomed in the house and said, they are all defying Caesar's decree, saying there's another king, one called Jesus. Have you know the world and the establishment of the culture of politics, uh, of, of government, uh, uh, of economics, of education, uh, of entertainment, uh, and all these establishments, how many of you know they're threatened uh, there might be another God? Can you hear me? And that's why these men were bothered because Caesar was the only God. 
You in Romans, the Romans there, they were mad because they would come to these uh, uh, Paulites and they would come to some of Paul's disciples and instead of saying uh, uh, they were supposed to greet like this, Caesar is Lord. That's how they greeted one another. Instead, they would, somebody would say, Caesar's Lord. And Paul's disciples would say, no, Jesus is Lord. Well, automatically, they could get arrested for that. How do you know the culture and the world today is threatened by your story? I smuggled Bibles into China many years ago. And in smuggling Bibles, think of this, a black book with white pages and black ink and no pictures. And they arrested one of the men that was with me because he had 120 Bibles in his backpack. For what? A black book with black ink and white papers. But yet, I saw businessmen going into China with Playboy and Hustler in their hands. And the Chinese government did nothing. What is in that book? What's in that book that they're afraid of? What is in you that they are absolutely intimidated by? Hello. My, my daughter was in college up in Boston, Massachusetts, and I wound this down. She was in college in Boston, and she was supposed to do a paper like all the other students. And in doing that, she called me and said, Dad, I've chose to do it on the effects of taking prayer out of the schools back in the 60s. I said, wow, that's a pretty bold subject. This was a secular college, a girl's school, all girl's school. I said, well, okay, I'll help you. So we went, did all the history, did all the pulling up of that and how crime and how everything began to take off from that time when prayer came out of the school and all that. And she got up into class. She gave that report. She was supposed to hand it in and orally give it. She handed it in. And he said, you don't need to stand up and give it. It's already done. I gave you a failing grade. Well, you got to know, an apple falls not too far from the tree. My daughter got up and said, excuse me. She said, you don't have to like it, but you have to give me a grade for at least for effort. And the people, the kids in the class went, that's right. And all of a sudden, there was a little bit of intimidation going on, and the professor gave her a better grade. Now, that was a good point for her, but the key is, what was he afraid of? How many of you know we've become too comfortable with the status quo. Come on. And everywhere around us, they can talk about nudity. They can talk and cuss and swear and talk about drugs and talk about everything. But if you say Jesus, you're in trouble. I get on the elevator sometimes just to be mean and wait till it's crowded and go, thank you, Jesus. I'm sitting in the airplane uh, on the runway in New York, uh, and it's snowing like crazy, and I'm in the middle of the plane, and it's a small plane, and they come on, we're out on the runway, they say, we're not going to take off, the weather's too bad, and some guy yells out, Jesus Christ, not the good way, he said it the bad way, and I, before I could think, I said, amen, I'm looking for a witness. As soon as it got out of my mouth, the stewardess came up and said, please, everybody, fix your seats, put your stuff away. They've cleared us. we got a little window in the cloud, and we're going up. I said, that's my Jesus. Can you hear me today? I'm sitting on an airplane. We're flying out of Miami. The right engine on a twin-engine plane, jet, American Airlines, blew up, caught on fire. Plane starts shaking. They were going back. We're only 5,000 feet in the air. We're circling. We're going back to land. They got trucks and fire trucks everywhere. We're going in like this, and, and it's rough. And I, I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed the, and I'd been witnessing to everybody, and I said, Jesus, this is not a good time to let this plane crash because I've told everybody, everybody how good you are. When I'm not talking, you can crash it, but right now, put the angels out here and keep it up. Well, I, I called my wife. I said, babe, I struck the th uh, card in the phone. I said, babe, look, there's a problem with the plane. One of the uh, motors is on fire. I'm okay. Don't worry. Uh, I'll call you back when we land. <laughs> so the guy in the plane beside me, he picks up the phone. He says, Shoo. called somebody. I think it was his wife. He said, I don't know. I don't know. We're okay. I don't know. I'll check. Hold it. Reverend, are we going to be all right? I said, we got to be all right. <laughs> he puts the phone down. We land. <laughs> all this stuff. We get to the terminal. We're there from 7 to 11. They're going to put us on another plane. 
Go back up again. It's the same plane. All they did was put the fire out, deal with some stuff. They thought they fixed it. And I'm going to tell you, I told them later I wanted double air mileage. And that plane took off. We got up in the air about three, four, five thousand feet. Boom, blew up again. Here we go again. I said, okay, that ain't no more. We're going to land this time. And I got the faith to land, but I ain't got the faith to hold us up again. <laughs> Funny part of the story was there was a Jewish couple sitting beside me. And, and, and when I got ready to get on the plane, the new plane now, it's one in the morning, and we're getting on the new plane, I'm standing in line, and I look, and the Jewish woman and the Jewish man are fighting. And you know, when Jewish people fight and they spit, you know, they, because they're talking, you know, in Hebrew, and I'm going, man. And the woman is chewing this guy out, and she finally slips over into English, and she says to the guy, if that preacher is on that plane, I'm going with him. You stay in Miami. So, so I get on the plane. God is my witness. I sit down. I'm on the aisle seat. She reaches across like this and puts her hand on my arm. And, and she just looks at me like, don't even think about telling me to take it off. <laughs> she, and the husband's got the little hat on. I mean, and I'm sitting there going, yes, ma'am. And she just got that thing there. We flew all the way to Baltimore. She never let go of my hand. I mean, the time I got home, my hand was hot as fire. She's holding on like a grip. We land, and I taxi, and I said, I said, we're okay. You, you can let go now. And she said, thank you so much. Like I helped her. How many you know, saints, your testimony could be keeping something going. Your testimony could get, be keeping people from giving up in life, committing suicide, turning away from uh, God for any hope. My God is a God uh, who's able to do above and beyond what you can ask or think. My God is an awesome God. And finally, it says, Acts 4, the religious establishment tried to shut down Peter's speech after the miraculous healing of the lame man in Acts 3. These men were Sadducees. Sadducee. Jesus who died, not believe. They didn't believe now. Jews, G, G, Jews didn't believe that you got resurrected from the dead. Jews in the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And Peter was preaching Jesus was alive. He was preaching the resurrection. They grabbed him, commanded him not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John responded, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. That's the title of the message today. Don't you blame me. Don't you find fault with me. I can't help it for what I've seen and what I've heard tells me that God is who he says he is. I've seen the blind see again. I've seen the cripple get up and walk again. I know that my God is alive today. And he's in this house to do a miracle for you. He's here to break that thing. We need a revolution. We need a revolution. We need a revolution. Of men and women who are not afraid of the gospel. For the gospel is the power of God under salvation. What a day, what a day, what a day. This is the day the Lord hath made. The day the Lord hath made. Worship team, you can go down there if you're needed. You can go down there if you're needed. Make sure they're paired up. Make sure they're paired up. If you're still coming, come on, because I'm going to pray. If you still need to come, get down here quickly. There's a mom coming right now. If you need to get down here, move now, because I'm going to pray. This is a hot moment. This is a hot moment. God's in the house. Uh, God's in the house. Yes, they're still coming. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Audience. Audience, not the worship, not the uh, praying people. Not the altar workers. Audience, look at me. You go to church, you could go a lifetime and not see a Sunday morning like this, saints. It's because prayer works. It's because the righteous uh, availeth much, the prayer of the righteous. Come on, there's people still moving in here. There's people still coming down here. We're going to pray the best prayer we ever prayed. Uh, we're going to pray the best prayer we ever prayed. Kristen, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you, man. God bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, saints, put your hand out this way. 
put your hand this way. If you're a believer, agree with me. College students, put your hands this way. Everybody praying. Father, in Jesus' name, we release the anointing of God, the power of God in this room, over this altar. We bless them. Jesus, come in their life. Save them. Deliver them. Deliver them from demonic oppression. Deliver them from lying spirits. Deliver them from lust. Deliver them uh, from those filthy things. And break that yoke off their neck. In Jesus' name, uh, I pray the blood of Jesus be applied. Uh, when they leave, they will never again be the same. Uh, in Jesus' name. 